God bless you guys on this beautiful day that the Lord has made. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and will be glad in it. And I pray that you all have the strength and the grace to do exactly the same thing. Yesterday is gone and, and, and it's, it's done away with. But I'm glad that today we find brand new mercies in the Lord if you have given your life over to him. And that what happened yesterday can be a stepping stone, as I've heard recently, for what's available for you today that can usher you forward for the tomorrows in your life. And so one of the things that I tend to remind the enemy is that, you know what, you might have had my yesterdays. When I was foolish and unskilled, you might have had me when I was immature or unwise or in rebellion. But you know what makes God good is that he can't have my today and he can't have my tomorrow. And because of that, I rejoice. I shout great shouts of praise. And I am mindful to remind myself every single day that God is good. And I dedicate my life every single day to the goodness of God. Because as long as you have God, it doesn't matter what life seems to present to you. It doesn't matter what you are presently going through. If you are someone who is 100% devoted to God and his sovereignty and you acknowledge him as the Lord overall, then honestly, there is no failure for someone like that. There's nothing but successes and breakthroughs and victories and crowns and overcoming and, and, and freedom for people like that because God is strong and God is in control. So there's, there's times in our lives where a lot of us can just get to a place where we just feel like Anything bad or everything bad that can ever happen to a person has or is or will happen. And many of the times the fear that is involved in having those experiences or, or, or emotions opens us up to where we begin to feel discouraged. And sometimes the discouragement can even get so bad that you can get depressed or even weary that you don't even want to continue anymore. This is why you can hear fatal tragedy, tragedies such as com people committing suicide or overdosing on um, illegal substances that the body is not designed to take um, or just giving themselves over to sin. I've heard so many people in past times where they just have been so hurt, they've been so broken or misused or abused that they just give themselves over to the destruction of the enemy or the destruction of what sin does. They just go headlong into that device because there is no hope that there's an escape available for them in their tomorrows. That's why we need Jesus. Without Jesus, we are hopeless and there is no escape. And we tend to come up with those conclusions, which is lay down and die. But I'm glad that God gives us wisdoms that we can read in his word and he can just refresh us every day on. And one thing that I want to pull out is one common one that I hear often in my midst. And one special person to me, um, my daughter, my youngest daughter is so beautiful, said something to me uh, today about this person. As I was mindful of this being her favorite scripture, uh, I mentioned her name and my youngest was like, oh my God, she, this person's my favorite person in the whole world. And I just felt like that was confirmation to know that, you know, God wants us to refresh ourselves on this verse and God wants us to have a deeper understanding of what this means so that the impact is deeper and is evident in our lives when we can actually open our eyes and understand what God is saying. Because, some, you know, we speak the same languages, you and I, or, or we have learned to understand measures of this language that you and I speak so we can hear the words. But the impact behind the words, the strength behind God's word sometimes doesn't affect us like it should. So when there's this light bulb effect that manifests and we hear the word of God and it hits us like it should, there is something that is awakened on the inside and we are able to walk in what God's word is 
is directing us to walk in. So in Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding In all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord and depart from evil. And I, and, and I hear the words. I, I, I understand what I just read in the superficial trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. That makes sense. You know, there's a God. We all acknowledge him. If everyone profess, whoever out there confesses themselves to be Christians, they all believe that he is this super, this supernatural being that is invisible, but controls everything. We understand that. And we also love to believe that, well, we trust him because whenever we need him to be like this magic genie for us, we know who to call on. So we have this, this imagination that God gives us things that we want, whether it's his desire for us or not, simply because it satisfies a inner desire or thirst that we have. And so I know that there's this unseen supernatural being that's supposed to be over all things that I can just call on and he responds to my beck and call. And if I want this thing, then I can pray to this unseen God and he is to respond to me. So I get it. Trust in the Lord. So, but so we can take the word of God and hear the words, but not have the faith for it to compute and translate in the spirit to impact our heart like it should. So let me tell you what I hear when I read these three verses, five, six, and seven in Proverbs chapter three. Again, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. You know what that says to me? That says to me that I cannot be one way in a moment and another way the next. That tells me that I can't give God half of my life and the other half I get to do whatever I want with it. That's a describing measures of lukewarmness, a measure of worldliness, a measure of carnality. God is saying he wants your whole heart, meaning in good or in bad seasons, good and bad moments. He wants us to always make sure that our hearts are given and geared towards him and that life, circumstances, people, places and things will not take our hearts from him. So trust in the Lord with all your heart. That for me to trust God with all my heart means that I love him in such a way that I know that he's not going to do evil towards me. That no matter what he puts me in or what he's trying to do or wants to do, that is for my good. It's for my advantage. And so giving myself to that and looking towards that, you know, the word of God says, look to the hills for where your help comes from. When I can look to God and ask him what he wants or what he's doing or tell me what I'm supposed to be doing. That is an extension of the trust of God moving in my life. I don't like what I'm doing. I don't like what I'm experiencing. I don't like what I'm hearing or feeling, but I know God is doing things that I don't always understand. And so that's why the other part is lean not to your own understanding because I am foolish by nature, because I know in part and prophesy in part, because I am a, a part of me is fallen in in this in carnal flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. So because my heart can do evil and deceitful things, and I don't know how bad of a person I can become unless I am put into um, time, times of hardships or gladness to actually expose the contents of my heart. I don't know. So God is in his wisdom warning us. The way to succeed, the way to peace, the way to inherit, the way to freedom and victory and to not lay down and just die or or give in to the devices of the enemy or just feel like there is no help in time of need or that there is no door of escape. The way to do that is to acknowledge that you don't have the answers, but God of heaven and earth, God of our creation, the, who you know, and we call on the name of Jesus, which is the access point to the father. He will, he, if I give myself to the fact that I don't know, but he knows and that I can walk by the spirit so that I don't fulfill the lust of my flesh and know I feel this way and, and, maintaining or entertaining the way that I feel 
will equate to these decisions and actions. I'm going to forsake that. I'm going to relinquish control over my life and I'm going to stand in the path of God. I'm going to stand on the path of righteousness. I'm going to allow him to lead me beside the still waters. I'm exemplifying a measure of trust in the Lord. And so if I trust God and I fear God, because the word of God says the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So if I could, if I could trust God that produces the fear that he is sovereign, then what's going to happen is that I am not going to lean to my own understanding. I'm not going to look at life from a superficial point of view. I'm not going to, um, evaluate certain interactions or people's dispositions for truth. I'm not going to allow perception to be louder than the voice of God. I am going to forsake who I am in my mind, what I'm capable to do in my heart and the conclusions that I can do as a fallen person and trust that God in me, the hope of glory will guide me in all truth. So I trust in the Lord with all my heart. So I'm not going to just give him my mind. I'm going to give him my life. I'm not just going to give him a few brief moments of my day he can have my entire day so I dedicate it to him I'm not just going to give him what I'm willing to lose I'm going to give him the things that are most precious to me that's why the Bible specifically warns us that we can't serve God and mammon, the riches of this world. We cannot be half-hearted like that. One is going to pull stronger than the other and we're going to give one, give ourselves to the other. So we're either going to love God or love the world, but we can't love both. But if I can give everything that I find precious to me and I can believe that God is leading me behind, beside still waters and I know I can confide in him when I'm afraid and he can calm the raging seas on the inside. That is me saying, I trust God. That is also me showing that I don't lean to my own understanding. The benefit of doing all that is in all your ways, acknowledge him. God, I I love you. I'm doing this as unto you. Acknowledge God. You are in control and I do things for your glory. Jesus acknowledged the father when he says, I do the things that always pleases God and other disciples like Paul acknowledges God when he says it's no longer that I live, but Christ that lives in me. Paul also acknowledges him when he says that to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. You have men and women of the Bible who have succeeded. We've been hearing many times of this woman that is in the in the book of Mark and in the other gospels of how she's been suffering through this ailment for several years and she's exhausted all of her 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 funds and and what she can do in herself. She trusted in certain things like we can trust in to secure us. But when those things fail us, like when our money fail us, when relationships fail us, when people who we thought were our friends forsake us, when our health declines and fail us, when our beauty begins to diminish and it fails us, what we have left is our faith in God, which is what should have always been moving all along. So with this woman, with this particular particular ailment that causes her to be an outcast bleeding for 12 years um she has this hope in this acknowledgement in this awareness that jesus christ is a healer why does she believe that because of many testimonies that up until this point she has heard and she knows that if i give myself over to this this opportunity if i walk into this door that has just been available to the world then i know something that i can't do for myself is going to be available to me i may not always know what that looks like i may not know what that might entail from me but i know that god has things that i need and i don't have on my own so so to to acknowledge him is to be sober minded under those con conditions of our existence god has what i need that's why in matthew 5 it says blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven the be poor in spirit is a form of humility and meekness that says i'm nothing but god is everything but if i have god i have everything and i live under that mindset that i am who I am because God is who he is and because he is good and beautiful and loving and faithful and forgiving and patient and kind, then I am, a, I am, he is, I have that available to me. So I am nothing. I give myself to the source of everything. So he makes me something. He makes me 
who I am. He crowns me in his glory. But in order to receive the water and the refreshing of the Lord that comes in the awareness that he is who is in control. And he has the doors. He's the one that unlocks the fountains of the deeps. He is the one that opens and rends the heavens and releases whatever he's going to release. He's the one that has the voices like many waters in the name of Jesus. He is the one that has lightning and flashing and thunders perceived from his throne room so if i acknowledge that that's who he is from the very words he he forms us in our mother's wombs and he knew us and from his words he framed the earth that we exist in and colossians tells me all things consist because of him i acknowledge him that he's not just a genie that i pray to when i'm sick or i'm afraid or i need something it's he, he's not just a figment of my imagination that makes me feel good when I want to feel righteous in front of a group of people. No, he is the author and the finisher of my faith. He is the anchor that keeps me grounded. He is my cornerstone that keeps things held up together. You remove that, then there, everything falls down. Jesus, when the disciples were admiring the, the temple that was built and available to them, because, you know, it's beautiful, and they're just admiring the artificry and the, and the craftiness of it all, you know. Jesus looks at it, and he says, a reality that we all got to acknowledge him about. He says, you know what? There's going to be a day that one stone is going to be standing upon another. Talking about the end of the world. So all the things that we admire, all the things that we go after, all of the things that can pull our hearts from God, there's going to be a point in time where none of those things are even going to be a substance. None of those things are going to be a, a refuge. None of those things are going to be a security to us. But he is the one. And we need to look to him. So knowing that we have to acknowledge that he is what keeps us together as the cornerstone, as the bishop of our souls, as the one that is is the the resurrection in the life and many other things that we can refer to Jesus, the road, the 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 rose of Sharon or, or and things like that. You know, the the he is his wings cover us and hides us from darkness and, and and danger and things like that. He says, in all your ways, what you're doing, who he is, what you think and perceive, and 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 who you believe you are and what you are implementing in, in life, acknowledge that he's God acknowledge that he has to approve and that he signs off acknowledge we don't make decisions or take a final step until he signs off on it the very angels have to present themselves before god every day even satan has to go before god and stand before the lord and acknowledge that he's god you have 24 elders and four living creatures in the presence of god every day acknowledging that he's holy 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 let the earth be filled with your glory every single moment of every single day there are there are creations and creatures that is acknowledging God for who he is and God is saying in order for us to succeed and not allow, allow life to swallow us up in order for us to overcome and not allow uh, the enemy or others to devour us we must acknowledge him in all of our ways we got to see that the angels submit to that we got to see that jesus christ submit to that our brothers and the sisters in the faith that we could read in the word of god have submitted to that and we see the outcomes of every single one that has acknowledged god in all their ways have succeeded so the promise here he says in all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your path if I stand still and know that he is God and I, and I know God, you are the lifter of my head. You are the reason why I breathe. God, I, I, I need this. I don't have it within myself. I don't have the means, the, the resources, the communications, the, the associations. God, I, I don't have this. I need this. I know you are God and I know what you do is what's best for me. So God, although I'm articulating, God, I want this and I feel like I can't live without it. I also know that you position me in a way to overcome and to be holy and acceptable to you. So what you're, what God is doing is making me faithful in these hours. So when I can stand before God and I say, God, 
This is what it is. This is who I am. This is how I feel. This is what I need. But nevertheless, not my will, God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I acknowledge him. I trust him. I'm leaning towards him. I will not slip nor fall. Someone like that will be anchored. Someone like that will be held. Someone like that will maintain their peace and safety in God in the name of Jesus. He says, in, in, in all your ways, acknowledge him. And he shall direct your path. He will tell you what to do from those point forward. He will tell you what your next action should be. He will tell you what's going on on the inside and what you need to do. If you do right, will you not be accepted in the name of Jesus? Paul says this beautiful, he shares this beautiful condition in Philippians chapter 1. And this is the loneliness of mind that we ought to have in Christ. As servants, as sons of God. Paul, we can read many letters in different churches. So we could say he is someone that has succeeded in, in his walk of faith with God. We could say that Paul is someone that has trotted upon serpents and overcome strongholds and has broken free from all kinds of curses from his, from in, in his life and and in the world, we could say that Paul has put the devil at an open shame by being an instrument or a weapon of warfare in the hands of the enemy. We could say many things about Paul. And yet we could see that towards the end of his ministry, he begins to say certain things that lets us know, no, I'm human. I, 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 and the Lord understands my frame. And my weaknesses. And the only reason why I've been able to do many things is because God has been my hand. God, his hand has been over me and he has been my help in time of need. When I felt like I needed to, when I felt like I, could, I couldn't go anymore, I knew my strength was in my praise. So he shows us that. I knew my, my encouragement was in the brothers and my sisters or my children in the faith that I raised up that I know are praying for me. And the hope in seeing their faces again in the natural, not just reading, writing these epistles or letters to them is what keeps me encouraged to press in. We hear the heart of Paul. You hear him writing to his beloveds and his sons in these churches about the only reason why he has not given up on life or has not allowed or has asked God to take his life away like we can hear with different people in the Bible like prophet Elijah has suffered and gone through so much for the glory of God you get so tired and worn down sometimes that you just ask God to take you God let me do my final assignments and let me accomplish the final missions in this life so I could just go and receive eternal rest I can't do it anymore we see that we can read that so we can feel that and because we can feel that we got to know where our help is from and we got to trust that he's doing it for us if we're aligned perfectly with him and he has our whole heart so paul's writing with these to these churches and he says i'm refreshed that i can hear your love and your benevolence towards one another He's saying, I am strengthened to hear that you guys are continuing and doing well in what I've taught you. My labor had not been in vain with you. And he says, that hate that keeps me up, that keeps me going. That's like a cold glass of water to him that he's drinking and it's refreshing his navel. He's acknowledging that God is good. And in, in Philippians chapter one, he says this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. But if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor. Yet what shall I choose? I know not. He's saying, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm having, a, I'm having a, a issue here. And he, and he describes it. For I am in a strait. I am stuck between two. I'm having a desire to depart, to go see God. And to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for the furtherance and joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ Jesus for me by the coming to you again. Do you hear this man of God that has suffered for the name of the Lord just as God has prophesied to him when he sent Ananias to pray for him when he was blinded? On his way to Damascus, seeing Jesus for the very first time and hearing about Jesus and Jesus taking full control of his life and redirecting him. Now you are mine. This is why you live and breathe and move and have your being. You do this and you're going to suffer for my name's sake. He was said. 
And we read the, the beatings, the imprisonments, the running, the hiding, the conspiracies behind his life, the sabotage, you know, that we can read that he had to go through and suffer just so that people can hear the good news of the love and the freedom that is found in Jesus Christ. And here he is with the lowliness of mind, acknowledging God and trusting in God still, saying, I'm in, I'm stuck between two decisions. I have a desire to depart and to be with my God, and with, uh, which is far better. Can we deny that? It's far better to go into heaven and to see all of what the treasures we have stored up in heaven because we were more mindful of storing up in tre treasures in heaven than we were than storing up treasures on earth. You know, we can all agree that it's far better to live in the mansions that Jesus has gone to prepare for us than these homes that we have bought or are renting. It's far better to go and to be with our maker. But we have someone who is so dedicated to God that even at his latter end, he's still acknowledging God in all his ways. And he's saying, I know this is best for me, but I don't live for me. I live for Christ. And so what's needful is that I continue with you guys because you guys need me. You guys need the safety and what I have still. You guys need the grace of God, the glory of God available in this form still. And so because that's true, the heart of Christ is I'm going to stay and remain with you guys. Why? I'm going to abide and continue with you all for your furtherance. And joy of faith that your rejoicing may be more abundant in Christ. I'm going to ask God to keep me still and to keep me strong so that I can continue to refresh you guys and to make sure your joy is real, that your faith is strong and that you can rejoice in the time of hardship in the times of persecution. You have the grace and your cup is overflowing enough to rejoice in those times of temptations in the name of Jesus. That is beautiful. That is beautiful. That's the same thing we see with Jesus when he was in the garden. He asked the three disciples to stay, watch and pray. Pray because, you know, the spirit is willing. The flesh is weak. He tells them to pray. They just can't. He goes to them a couple of times, see them falling asleep. He's admonishing them. Y'all need to pray. Y'all need to pray. He goes far off and he's crying out to God. I think it's described that his tears we're like blood. If it's not that passage, it's in one of the passages when he was suffering for the name of Jesus. He's crying out to God, crying out to God, crying out to God. God, you know, because I'm telling you, just like how I said it in the beginning, we could feel like, man, I don't have, I don't have anything else to give. I don't have any more of me. I've, I'm, I'm undone. I, I, everything that I have is all depleted. I, I've given everything, God, and but yet God is still saying, finish the work, though. God is still saying, but keep going though. How can I keep going when there's nothing left in me? And then you realize, acknowledge him in all your ways and he will direct your path. Meaning he will, he will fill your cup again when it's running low. He will send this wind, this cool wind when the, when the, when the sun of the day is smiting you. He will, he will, he will, he will do miraculous things just to keep you up. You know, he will, he will have people around you. That's why we can't forsake the brethren, the, the gathering of the saints. He will call, he will call brethren to refresh you and he will put you on their minds to, to pray for you and to lift you up. My God, the, the power that is found in the prayers of the right, the prayers of the righteous man, they avail much. He says, yeah, when you feel like you're weak. My strength is made strong. It's perfected because now you can't vaunt yourself. Now you can't say it was me. We have to accredit what you accomplished to God, to God and all your ways. Acknowledge him and he shall direct your path. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. Fear the Lord. Fight to contend against the, the temptations of the flesh, the flesh. Contend against the devices of the enemy. Contend against your atmosphere. Contend against the strange voices that's trying to lead you astray. Because you fear God. Fear what he can do to the soul more than what can happen to your body. He will guide you in all truth, the word of God says. I am refreshed. And I praise God. That you and I, because we have God, we will live and not die. He says he's a resurrection in life. He says he give us life 
giving water. He says, if you drink of this water, you'll never thirst again. You'll ne and we'll never thirst again. What is that? What does that look like? How does someone live like that? Now hope purifies me, man, to get to a place where God can, per, can, can supply in such a way that it satisfies everything that I can, that nothing, nothing can ever satisfy ever again. Nothing will dare. I wouldn't even consider to give my heart to, to what? What? I have life-giving water. You come, you know, that woman at the well, you, you could, people come to wells every day because they need to be replenished. Every day, every day. You know, I've visited countries and islands where wells are still very prominent in their society. And pumps of water is still how they they get what they want. A lot of them don't still have indoor plumbing from what I experience. It might be a little different now because it's been a couple of decades since I've been in the islands. Every day they have to do this. Every day if it's water they need to bathe, to cook with, to clean they have to go to this reservoir. They have to go to this source of where the water is. In the spirit, Jesus says, man, if you have me, that constant having to go back and to refill yourself of what you need, it's going to stop because he's just going to be this, this consistent connection of outflow that's just connected. You know, he is the vine and you are the branches, like this connection that feeds you, the nourishment, the strength, the perseverance, the dedication that you need, the grace, the power, the victory, the vision that you need to, to succeed and not perish. You know, people perish because they don't have vision. They don't have the insight or the foresight. And Jesus, yes, says, yeah, but I, I have life-giving water. And if you drink of this water that I provide, you'll never thirst again. We know what that means officially, but in everyday life, what does that look like? When I'm growing tired and I just want to give in or give up or compromise or begin to doubt, does God do miraculous things or will God break me free from this or God, will there ever be a breakthrough? Will there ever be a release? Will there ever be a, a change? Will there ever be an overthrowing of the enemy? You got to know that that source is with you and he's doing what you cannot see. That's why we can't live by what we see. But what we know is true about God. I pray that I anchored someone today and that you are revived in great strength. Jesus wants to rejuvenate and regenerate you. And we got to know we cannot give up. God says, if you will endure until the end of every season, till the end of your life, if you are someone who has endurance as you should, you will be saved. You will be saved. You will be saved in, in the temptations that comes and takes many people away. You will be swept up by the hands of God or the wings of the, of the Lord when the tsunamis of life comes and you will be saved that at your dying bed and when you're about to take your last breath, you are still holding God and you are still acknowledging him. And you are still trusting him and you are still allowing him. And even in those moments to direct your path, he said, Says, you will be saved if you're that kind of person. I'm not afraid to deny myself. I'm not afraid to, to pick up my cross because I know where my help comes from and he has never failed me and I don't, I don't see him failing me in my tomorrows. I love you guys. God bless you. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might in the name of Jesus.